Hello and welcome to the AMS uh, webinar series on preparing to teach online. My name is Kate Stevenson from California State University. I'm also the chair of the Committee on Education for the AMS and I'm sitting in for Abby Herzig, uh, the Director of Education at the AMS. Before introducing today's speaker, I wanna run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, please remember that this webinar is being recorded. So if you participate, you are agreeing to being part of that recording. A recording of this webinar will be posted uh, on the same page where you may have found this, um, the registration and I will put that uh, link in the chat in a moment. Please do use the chat to ask any questions and feel free to answer each other's questions and share resources through the chat. I will be keeping an eye on the chat and I'll interrupt Paul from time to time if I see that there's a question that's uh, relevant at that moment. Um, we will continue past the hour to make sure that we get to all the questions that were asked. Um, we will not be monitoring the raised hands, however. When you leave the webinar, you'll notice that you're directed immediately to a survey. Please do take a moment to fill out the survey. It doesn't take very long, about 30 seconds, but that information is very helpful to the AMS. So now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Seberger. Paul is a professor of mathematics at Monroe Community College, where he has taught since 1998. Between 2008 and, two, and 2019, Paul was the lead PI on two NSF grants focused on helping students visualize multivariable calculus and differential equations, developing the Calc 3D Plot app, uh, so Calc Plot 3D app, sorry, and a directional field app to run on both computers and mobile devices. Paul has been teaching online since spring 2013, starting with multivariable calculus and then adding differential equations in 2015. In addition to teaching online and developing tools for visualization in the mathematics classroom, Paul has also been active in editing and customizing open educational resources, o OER resource textbooks, and online homework problems in the LibreText and WebWork platforms, respectively. So now, Paul, I hand over the power to you. So thank you for joining us today. You're welcome, glad to be here. So I just wanted to share um, my online uh, teaching experiences, I guess. Um, I've only taught so far these two classes, multivariable calculus first, and then differential equations second in an online format. And I'll have to admit that um, this is, these are in the days before COVID, of course, I was very hesitant to teach online at all. Uh, I felt that I'd really not be able to have the same expectations of my students. I wasn't sure how I was gonna grade uh, their work, help them understand what I expected and, and hold them to the standards that I, I have for my, my teaching and from, for the students that I have in my face-to-face -face classrooms. But as I thought about it, and once I was asked and requested from my chair to teach online, um, I began to put together some things that I felt could make the class something that I would feel comfortable uh, teaching in this online format. And I guess I've really been glad to have that, particularly now this year <laughs> with everything going online. So these experiences have helped a lot. I will have to admit that uh, the uh, preparation that I made for uh, bringing these classes online is something that would be difficult to do really quickly. It did take me a good amount of time, particularly for developing the, the lecture video component of my courses. So that's what I'm gonna to begin to go through are the components that I use, and I'll show you the actual courses uh, from a student view anyway, uh, so you can see what they look like. So let me go over here, actually, let's see, there we go. So this is, this is just listing the number of times I've taught these courses approximately. Um, so multivariable calculus about 13 times online, differential equations about 12 times since fall 2015. Um, so the most important component for me and what really took the most amount of time and therefore it's probably the toughest thing to create quickly uh, is the set of lecture videos that I recorded in a face-to-face -face class uh, using a, a smart board and the uh, smart record software and a wireless mic. And actually, since that time, since I started doing this in 2012, I've recorded all of my classes. Um, it, it allows me to, to have the students be able to uh, 
have that video available if they want to go back to it later. And it gives me something that I can use for these online classes if I do end up needing to take a class online, which has been helpful in this, this year. So the lecture videos are taken from the full face-to-face -face class content. I take the video and edit it in Camtasia. I put in a table of contents, which helps students be able to locate each example and maybe watch part of it, come back and watch more of it. Uh, it also allows them to go back and, and look at a particular example they wanted to see again. And I've actually had no students complain about it being, the videos being too long, even though some of them are 40 minutes uh, or even slightly more sometimes. But they really uh, have, have said that that's the best part of the online classes is the set of, of video lectures that I have. And that's been true in both of the classes here, the Calc 3 and the differential equations. So in the differential equations course, I use three OER textbooks. Um, I really just felt in terms of what I was finding in the OER, OER books that the three books covered my content the best versus just trying to pick one of them. And as you'll see in some of the comments students have made, uh, they actually have seen that there is some benefit, particularly at this upper level of having more than one perspective from uh, the books if they have time to look at them. I'll have to say in the summer session, I just completed teaching. They did look at it some, but I think that they probably had less time to look at the textbooks than my students in the regular semesters have. So in multivariable calculus, I began using an OER customized version of OpenStax Calc 3 uh, on the LibreText platform about a year ago. I'm trying to think, maybe two years ago. It was either 2018 fall or 2019 fall. I'm trying to remember which it was. I think it was 2018 fall, but um, I've really been enjoying uh, having that uh, custom book. And if I have time, I'll, I'll show a little bit more of that later. Um, because that really, I think having the OER book that you can link to, and that you can um, even customize and make uh, extra examples and add additional features to has really been helpful in improving this online class. And really, it improves my face to face class as well. So a lot of the components I'm sharing except possibly the lecture videos, although again, I record all of those. So uh, the sort of the raw video I record for my classes is there for the face-to-face -face classes too. But all the other components, except for maybe the discussions too, I don't use with my online or my face-to-face -face classes as much. So um, online homework, I use WebWork, which is a, an OER free uh, homework system. And I have 18 problem sets I use with my differential equations, equations class and 15 sets I use with the Calc 3 class currently. Um, more important, I guess, is, is what I put in them um, really just trying to get a chance, especially in the online format. I find these web work sets to be really helpful to gauge the student pr progress, uh, getting through the content and giving them some accountability um, that's more direct and immediate and more feedback that's more immediate than I'm able to do with uh, written homework assignments. So that is an important component. And it was something that I really beefed up or worked hard to improve right as I went online with these classes because of that uh, ability to be able to keep track of student progress. Now, I was afraid when I first went to teach online that I might not be able to still give the same graded written homework assignments, that it would be too complicated uh, and difficult. And it turns out it was much easier than I expected. And learning how to do it in the online classes made it my life a whole lot easier this spring as I began taking all of my classes into a remote uh, online format where I was seeing them in Zoom each day for their class, but then they were turning in their assignments in this written online format. And essentially what I've had the students do is use an app like Cam Scanner or Genius Scan on their phone. Most of them use that, a few might use a scanner still, but to create a single PDF of each written assignment and then to submit that in a Dropbox or submission page on uh, Blackboard, which is what I use. Paul, can I just jump in? There's a question. Do you use web work as ungraded practice or graded practice? I use it as graded practice. So I'm really, you know, most of my students, at least at the community college level, don't do optional. So even having a point of grade value uh, associated with a problem will motivate them to do it. And so it ends up being, it depends on the semester. I think I've increased the, the weight of the web work as I've gone online but it's approximately 10% of their grade is their uh, written and online homework, or I think this semester it might have been 10% each. So I really weighted them a little bit more heavily. 
So I, I want to encourage students to complete these assignments. They do in the web work, if you're familiar with it or maybe just familiar with other online systems, um, they are able to keep going until they get 100% most of the time, unless it's a true false or maybe multiple choice, some of those where they're limited in the number of attempts they can make. I'll show you a few problems from web work a little bit later here. So the written assignments have been really uh, important to help my students know what I expect in terms of written, um, written process and procedures and, and the notation, getting all of that down, which in these courses, at least, multivariable calculus and differential equations, those are what I care most about, and it's their ability to write the math out clearly. And unfortunately, I feel that the movement toward online homework has almost exclusively pushed away a lot of that written feedback and so the notation is, is a little bit weaker now than it used to be in terms of students coming into my classes. Even those coming from universities, uh, which in the summer I get a lot of the students from all over different, you know, really good universities that uh, take my class. And I feel like they aren't always as strong as they, they could be in that area. So that's one of the reasons I have these written assignments. Um, fifth, I have online visualization tools. This is something I've been working on for years before. I even began teaching online, but it's something that really plays well into the uh, online teaching environment. So I get my students to visually verify or check results in their differential equations using a direction field. I have them visually check the intersection of two planes in a uh, Calc 3 class and be able to show that what they've got on paper, their results actually look correct when they gra graph them in these apps that I've created. We also use Desmos, um, perhaps some other things too, in addition to things I've created to visualize. Um, graded online class discussions is a component that, again, I haven't used as much in my face-to-face -face classes, although I do use it in my Honors Calc 1 class that I'm gonna be teaching again this fall. So that's uh, a place that I've brought more writing in, but I actually think my online classes probably could be considered writing intensive uh, because of the amount of, of discussions I require. Um, let's see, the uh, one component of those class discussions, um, I think I give two in my Calc 3 class and three typically in my differential equations, equations class, except in the summer when I just give two. Um, but I give these student video presentation discussion assignments where the students have to create a three to five minute uh, presentation of themselves presenting a problem. And uh, then to comment, view and comment on at least three of their classmates' um, videos. And it's worked really well. I was afraid students were gonna rebel and not wanna do this, but um, I've had a lot of feedback that was very positive. In fact, almost exclusively positive uh, from students, even students who struggle. So um, here's just a, a view of the page. It's actually a little bit older coloring on the left side, but of my lecture area of my course. I'll show that in a minute, but it shows how I've got a lecture link here that um, students can open the lecture video with. And then below it, I have, at least for the differential equations class, a link to my guided notes that they can uh, open and print and then be able to fill in either on paper or some of them use a tablet to fill that in. And then I have links to the readings in my online books, my OER books, and that's really helpful. Uh, below that, I would have the practice problems, which you can see for lesson two, I've got a list of problems and a link that goes right to uh, that problem set. Uh, let's see, this is just another example, but talking about the lecture videos. Um, let's see, the OER books I've used uh, for differential equations, I, I actually refer them to Paul's online notes. Many of them had used that as a reference before, and I'd used it some as I began teaching differential equations uh, in 2011, I guess. Um, I use William Trench's book, and I've now moved to a version of that that's on LibreText, and I hope to be able to customize that um, and adjust some of the notation in a couple of their, those sections, probably more and more as I have time. Um, and then Jury Label's Notes on Diffie Cues. So that's uh, another great resource that I've used, again, at free books for differential equations. And then in my Calc 3 class, I have began to customize an OpenStax Calc 3 book, or the OpenStax Calc 3 book, I should say, um, and done it on the LibreText platform. So I've been able to put my own images in for each chapter, and I'll show you that a little later. I added some sections and examples and so forth. You're welcome to 
uh, view that. Uh, if you can't find it by a search, you can let me know and I can help you find a link to that book. All right, let's see. So students have commented on various components and I'm gonna show you the actual courses in a little bit, but I figured it's good to get through some of these things on PowerPoint. But some comments that they've made on the OER books. Uh, one said, like before, I found the Dawkins text to be most helpful. I take it he might have taken me for another online class. Um, but um, trench and label were useful as more traditional textbooks and having a multiple explanations for the same material was a great help. And that confirmed my statement earlier that um, having multiple explanations from different perspectives might be useful for these students, particularly at this level. I don't think I would do that at uh, you know, a basic algebra level. Um, I think having a single book there is, is helpful, <laughs> probably more helpful if you're gonna get them to read the book at all. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna read all of these comments, but I wanted to just display them and maybe pick out a few things from them that are uh, interesting. I think the third comment here says the same idea about having multiple textbooks seems useful, seeing them worked out in slightly different uh, ways, but netting the same results helped me when I was confused. Paul, there were a few questions on homework. I got booted out and had to come back in, so I just want to make sure that may maybe those got asked. Um, so there were some questions on web work that I think got answered. There was also comments on using grade scope, wondering whether you've ever tried that. Um, mm -hmm. And also how do you grade or mark the written homework and quizzes? Well, uh, to grade the written work, I have the students first enter their assignments in uh, the uh, PDF, a single PDF form. Mm -hmm. And I think I have some more on this a little bit later. Let me uh, jump okay. through this so I can address that question. Or we can just leave it for when it comes up in your talk, that's fine too. That's okay, um, I'll just go backwards here yeah. from this. It doesn't really matter what order I cover these things in, um, really. So the graded written homework, I have them submit it as a single PDF. My next step is to download the entire set of, of submitted files from uh, Blackboard. So I use the Blackboard gradebook to do that. And once I've got that zip file, I open it up and I have set up OneNote to, um, when, it, when it's printed to, to add all the uh, pages that are printed or all of the, I guess, uh, PDFs that are printed as separate uh, sections on a single, um, I guess it's separate pages on a single section. I'm trying to get the words right there. But basically I'm able to name it uh, the, the sheet there as uh, quiz one, and then when I print to it, it will automatically add each student's assignment one at a time uh, down a, as a list on the, on the side. And so I'm able to then, uh, basically at the top, I type each person's name with a uh, little HW1 or Q1 to designate homework one or Q, quiz one next to their name. And that becomes the file name I'll save it as later. But once I have that, I'm actually able to use my iPad, which is mo can, recently become the most convenient way to do this with OneNote to grade the assignments with a, one of the iP what is it, Apple pens. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really been a nice way to go through and grade these. Um, once they're graded, I go back to my PC and on OneNote I can uh, put a, a little shortcut link that allows to save to PDF the current page. And so then I save them back, each one of them as a page or as a PDF, which is gonna have all my grading marks in it. And then I'm able to go back into Blackboard, which is what I use uh, for the learning management system. And I'm able to return that assignment um, by attaching that file in the feedback. Uh, so they, the assignments. back and forth is via your learning management system, not via Dropbox or some other means. Correct, correct. Yeah, there are probably many ways to do this. I have found this to be the most convenient and it does put those assignments in there. So it's easy for me to access again uh, in a later semester even, if I'm curious, the students retaking my course, uh, which, uh, what, you know, what do they have for a test in that semester? You know, what do they have on the, that particular uh, assignment? So mm -hmm. it gives me a chance to look back at them easily, even though on OneNote I have some ability to do that, although uh, my space keeps running out on <laughs> online. <laughs> and those PDF smartphone apps that you mentioned? Yeah, I've had them use um, Cam Scanner or Genius Scan. 
-hmm. And I think one of my students this semester said cam scanner was beginning to uh, give him some kind of problems in terms of wanting to be paid or something. So I don't really know what the what the truth is there, but I know that that's a, uh, an app that many students have used. And then Genius Scan is another one that's very similar. It allows them to you know, just, again, scan one page at a time and very quickly create a single PDF from a written assignment and submit that. So I guess I could do another webinar on how to grade uh, online <laughs> assignments because I could actually show that in step-by-step -step process, but I did not prepare that component uh, for today's lesson. So today's... We, we can say, save that for October when we'll see you again. <laughs> that would be fine. So yeah, today's presentation doesn't include that uh, version, that part. Um, so let's see. Um, since I'm on this page, I think I've already covered a lot of this. Um, I do sometimes have the students attach a visualization uh, printout, which might just be a PDF that they've joined with their other PDF uh, that they scanned earlier using uh, a tool, an online PDF tool that I send a link for. And that uh, it makes it really easy for them to put it all, put it at the end of their PDF and then submit that all as one assignment. Uh, let's see, so I'm gonna go back. I guess I was here. Um, yeah, that's good. So WebWork Online Homework, um, I've got a number of sets I give. This is just a quick view of some of those sets for differential equations. But if anybody's interested, I'd be glad to um, let you, I guess, enter as a guest and see some of those homework sets or share with you what I've done there. So some problems uh, that I've perhaps edited, some of them are the way they were. Uh, the ones I like best and actually the ones students comment on that they like best are those that actually have students entering multiple steps for the same problem. And the reasons they like that are that it helps reduce their frustration, uh, it helps them to know if they're on the right track, um, confirms whether they're doing the problems right. And the reason I like them is because it gives us a way to capture the process that they're using and to encourage the right process. And so I guess I'm, I've got a couple of problems that are particularly good that way that I can show, but um, I guess even having multiple parts gives you a larger snapshot of the student understanding than a single component would give. So these are some problems that I particularly like in the differential equations group. Um, let's see, I'm not giving you a lot of time here. Um, this substitution one is nice because it asks them to actually state the substitution and then the derivative of that component um, sort of do some of the steps as they go through it and then give the final answer at the end. A lot of online homework systems will only ask for the final answer at the end. And I think, you know, this is one of the components that I continue to work on in developing more uh, problems that break them up into steps. But I think this, this uh, intermediate step approach to online homework problems is really important in the mathematics area. Uh, especially when we want to encourage a particular process that students take. And if there are multiple processes that we want to encourage, you know, multiple techniques that could be used, I, I would recommend just developing a couple different problems that take the students through the same kind of problem in different ways. And, you know, we can give them written assignments to see if they know it from scratch. And maybe a few of these problems after we've gotten them through uh, this kind. But I really think that, the, you know, some people call this, you know, scaffolding and Oh, we don't want to give them scaffolding all the time, but I really think it's, it's important in this online mode uh, to capture the process and they're, you know, it's similar to their written work. And so anyway, that's, that's some of my uh, two cents about that little mini presentation in the middle of this presentation. This is a similar problem. Again, asking them to solve this Bernoulli differential equation, showing their various steps in the process, identifying components, making their substitutions and so on. Um, this is a visual problem, asking them to identify or match, I guess, the differential equation with its phase line. If you teach differential equations, this might look familiar if you teach this particular topic, uh, which many do. Uh, let's see, this one is a particularly useful problem. Students seem well, to really, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Again, these are web work problems at this point, right? Yeah, these are all web work problem examples. You can get these kind of problems probably in many systems. You could create problems that um, have intermediate steps if they're not already there in other systems. I like WebWork because it's free and um, I've learned how to use it. So I've used it now with all of my classes, um, algebra through differential equa equations. 
So anyway, this problem type really requires students to practice finding and identifying the particular solution form for an undetermined coefficient approach to solving uh, basically uh, second order, maybe third order uh, linear differential equations that are non-homogeneous, have a non-zero function on the right side there. And so this has really helped my students to practice and pick this up more strongly. Just saw a video from one of my students in my online class this summer. I saw it today. He did a particularly good job on this particular problem, I think it was, uh, presenting it. Here's a problem that I created that requires the students to go through variation of parameters using a particular approach that I uh, want to see them learn and uh, having them fill in the components to the uh, determinants there and uh, identify the results. It actually allows them to put them in either order and still marks them right as long as they're consistent. So it's sort of an interesting first page actually of the problem. I think there's more, but it does say part one at the top. Here's part two. So I'm not showing you enough here to really get a full view of these because you're not having time to look at the full picture, but I'm really just trying to give you an idea of the kinds of problems that I'm having my students complete in these web work assignments. And they're not all multiple step, but these are the ones that I think are the most useful. So some comments students have made on web work. Um, the web work assignments were very helpful in my opinion. I'm glad they thought that. I do get a lot of complaints, by the way, uh, <laughs> that that's too much work. Uh, the variety of questions asked made me feel very, very confident in my understanding of each topic when I was able to solve them correctly. Very good preparation for the test. So, I mean, that's, again, a positive comment. Many of the students in the feedback that I ask at the end of the, end of the semester are much more positive about web work than they were earlier in the semester because they begin to see how it's helped them learn the material. There are still, still students who complain. They that say web work was just too much work, took too much time, but you know, it's the way that I really help them practice enough to get the material down well. Uh, this is a long one, so I don't know. Let me just see if I can pick something out of this. Um, you thought it was the best resource in the course. That's cool. He liked that it didn't give him the answers or large hints. And I thought that was cool because that is what some of the students want. They want a system you know, like the other, many of the other commercial systems that give them a similar example or help, you know, to solve the problem. And then they can just do the same thing again to solve this problem. And part of my goal in web work is to give them questions that take them beyond what we've done in class and to get them to actually use what we've learned to do a, a novel approach to a problem. You know, not changing things too much, but maybe going backwards and thinking about it in a different direction. And so I'm really glad that it doesn't just give them a similar example every time. And there are ways of making it do that, but I t choose not to let that happen. But uh, let's see, this student thought that it was less difficult to use web work in this class than in differential equations, and it wasn't count three. I'm not sure uh, exactly why, but uh, I think these problems tend to be a little harder in my opinion, but, but he liked where the problems took him through the steps of the process, thought those were the most helpful. So again, what I was bringing up earlier, um, what I like to see are those problems students really value those too. I like to be checked as they go. I did this discussion earlier in the graded written homework. Um, some visualization tools. I could show these more in a minute, um, but just helping the students to visually check uh, solutions to first order differential equations in this context. And then in, um, I guess, Calplot 3D, my other app, there are ways of looking at uh, face portraits of a system of differential equations and really doing some very interesting things there. Um, Calc 3, Calcplot 3D is something I developed for teaching Calc 3, multivariable calculus, and it gives you the ability to graph uh, surfaces, maybe look at the intersection of two planes and see that the line of intersection you get actually fits through that intersection of the two planes and, and, and more things like that. So really, I use it a lot in my lectures, uh, maybe five minutes here, five minutes there, to visually take a look at what we've been looking at on the board. Um, and then I have my students complete assignments where they use it to use these apps to check their solutions. And then and for Calc 3, I have some explorations that look at various concepts and have them step through a series of examples and consider what's going on. What's the relationship between this acceleration vector and this velocity vector on this particular parameterization of this curve in the plane or in space. 
and really beginning to answer questions based on that and to build some intuition. Uh, this is just, again, some more images from Calplot 3D that I was able to rotate and play with and so forth. Uh, now, discussions are a big component that I want to make sure I talk about because I think I at first wasn't sure, you know, how can I have a discussion in an online math class? What is that going to look like? And so when I first started, I did a lot of asking around and got some really good recommendations that I've implemented. I also went to, of course, a number of conferences and picked up things at various conferences that I've incorporated in here to this uh, discussion component of my online classes. This is something that everybody can implement fairly quickly uh, and you can choose what you want to use as your questions. So one of the sort of go-to discussion uh, prompts that I've used is having the student ask a math question about the current topic, topics, I guess, and answering at least one, and now I actually require them to answer at least uh, two or three, I think at least two uh, other students' questions or address them. Paul, well, can I jump in just because you were talking about direction field and cal uh, calcplot 3D. There's a couple of questions about where they can find more information about, and we'll post those uh, at the end of the talk. But have you run into any issues with students not being able to use these apps based on tech requirements? Do you mean in terms of vision? vision? Impairment type of things, I suspect it's, I'm not sure this is a question from Martha and it, I'm guessing that it's based on the, the technology that the student is in possession of. Oh, I haven't actually had too much trouble with that yet. Um, the apps work on phones now. Um, they used to be Java applets and so they didn't uh, work on devices like that, but these are now in JavaScript and so they work on phones just like the web work does and I guess those all work better even than my Blackboard does on, on a phone, although Blackboard's gotten better. <laughs> so I haven't had any trouble yet with that. Um, so, you know, they are very visual. So if you have someone that's it's got visual impairment, I would guess that it would be most helpful to have someone sit down with them and, and work through describing what's going on in the motion because things are moving and it's not a static image. So there's probably more that can be done there. but. That's, that's what I've done so far. So uh, on what you're talking about with classroom discussions, they're wondering about your classroom size. Well, my typical class has been around 20, uh, to be honest, but in the summer, I have more. So this summer I had 37, um, trying to think, I think I had 47 at the beginning. So it, it got down to 37 by maybe midway through the, the seven week session. So. You know, the more students you have in that uh, online class, the more difficult it is to moderate these, but it is something that you could probably have a student aide do if you have that uh, um, available to you. Um, for many of them, just going through and checking that things are on task, that they're, you know, actually answering each other's questions, that they're fulfilling the requirements. But uh, I really do enjoy uh, learning a little bit about my students through these discussions, particularly the vid video presentation uh, discussions. So anyway, as I was saying earlier, um, having the students ask each other questions and answer them, writing out the mathematics and even using the um, equation editor in Blackboard and the editor in the, uh, you know, I guess what is it called, the dialogue area <laughs> that you can create uh, equations in, uh, has really been helpful. I think it, it really increases the student learning to have to express themselves you know, verbally in that way, um, even though it's, probably you know, even better when they do the video presentation as well, we'll see. Um, another topic I asked them about in both of the online classes uh, is to describe something significant they learned out of the material. So that often brings out some topic that they thought was particularly interesting or that was sort of an aha moment. And that's been really interesting to see. Uh, what is the most interesting topic? It's a similar idea. Uh, maybe what's you know, most beautiful? What's, uh, what application did you like? those kind of questions. Uh, at the end of the course, I asked for class feedback, and that's where I've gotten some of these quotes from. That's one of their last discussions. Okay, and then in differential equations, one of the richest discussions that's just written has to do with the students finding a first order differential equation application. And so going out either to their own field, or if they can't find one in their own field, then looking elsewhere, and just finding some interesting application that's beyond 
supposed to be beyond what we've presented in class and, um, and talk about it, describe it carefully, um, hopefully come up with a sentence to describe the relationship that generates the differential equation, such as you know, the rate of change in the population is uh, directly proportional to the size of the population, that kind of thing, but hopefully somewhat more interesting than that one. Um, inserting a direction field into it, showing some work uh, to solve it, showing the, the final solution if they're able to, to state that. And really uh, then you're just making it clear what's going on with that application. And then they have to comment on each other's applications. And I see a lot of comments from students in these, this particular discussion about how useful differential equations seems to be. And wow, um, I've always been told math was good for something and now I can really see, this is really cool to see how you know, differential equations seems to be useful in all these different areas. So it's really been a neat uh, discussion to get students thinking about. How do you uh, grade those? Oh, there we go, graded online. <laughs> there we go. Well, I don't know if this is a, the right uh, sheet still. It's still the same thing, but I grade them pretty generously, although I have a rubric for some of them that is uh, spelled out, uh, particularly for the video discussions, uh, telling them all the components they need to fill in. But for others, I'm just looking, you know, did they reply? Um, that's important. This is a discussion. It's not just a post. And so making sure that they've replied and valuing that, um, you know, 10, 20, probably 20, 30 percent, sometimes more, depending on the discussion. And then the, the content of their post, you know, is it saying something meaningful or is it really just hardly saying anything? And that, of course, is a judgment statement, judgment call on my part. It's an area that I want to actually improve is to try to figure out better rubrics to encourage even better behavior uh, in these discussions. Not that I'm seeing bad behavior, I just mean poor posts. So um, pack back is something I've just been exposed to and it seems most useful for um, humanities type of discussions, but I could see it being useful in a discussion like the one on the applications where there might be resources that are um, being used, it, it pack back has the student site where they get their information from and encourage them to, you know, really make a more meaningful post. So it's just another idea out there that I've just seen as another option to consider. Um, down at the bottom of this page, I, I have a um, multivariable calculus specific discussion post or prompt that has to do with um, describing an application of the dot and or cross product. Uh, to other disciplines. And I've gotten a lot of very interesting applications of the dot and cross product described in those posts. Um, and then posting some favorite contour plots and function of two variables, uh, posting uh, what they learned from the visual concept explorations I, dis I discussed or mentioned earlier. So very meaningful um, student learning that they're able to report on and discuss in those kind of discussions. So this was just a quick um, poll that I made today from a discussion in my class I just finished teaching. It's from the, the Ask a Question student forum. So one of the students asked, you know, while watching the lectures dealing with linear first order differential equations, they got hung up on a part. Um, they didn't understand the part uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse here or my cursor, the part where we have the m mu prime of x over mu of x equals p of x, and then throwing that in there as a choice and getting the ln. They didn't understand that. And this other student explained why this worked this way and was able to you know, give, it, give them a point back to the derivative of the natural log function being equal to u prime over u and how this made sense then. And then student one got it and said, you're totally right. And so basically, I've seen this happen over and over again, that the students are able to actually answer a lot of their, each other's questions and to improve their, their learning as they go. And I jump in when I see questions that aren't answered, but I've had, not had to jump in as much as if they'd all been asking just me uh, their questions. And they do have the opportunity to ask me questions in the Ask a Question forum or uh, they always want to email me, but I always try to get them back to the ask a question form so everyone can benefit. Are there any other questions waiting? Uh, we have a, a few, so but I'm not sure they're right on this topic. So I was waiting on those to see if you cover them. I think we're okay for okay. now. All right. So the next and probably the 
what I think is the most fun and valuable component that I've been able to add is something I learned about at a conference, and I can't remember which conference I was at, if it was MathFest or a Joint Math um, or ICTCM, but it was one of those three. And I went and heard someone present on how they had their students create uh, video presentations. And I think it might have been for a face-to-face -face class. I don't remember if it was for a face-to-face -face or online class, but I decided to give it a try. And I actually did this in the first time I taught online, which was, I think, spring 2013. And I had the students create a three to five minute video of themselves presenting a problem from the course. And eventually I had them do two of them in my Calc 3 class and generally three in my differential equations class. And I thought at first students were going to just rebel and, and have such a hard time with this, but it turned out, although some had, had some initial problems, you know, with the technology and figuring out which way they wanted to record themselves, I gave them a lot of options. They could just write the problem out and then uh, use something like Screencast-O-Matic or some kind of screen recorder to record themselves explaining the problem step by step, um, which is the easiest way. But then I gave a little bit of incentive to give some bonus points to write it out carefully and clearly. Uh, and other ways people have done it is to show index cards one at a time uh, to show the steps of the problem. Um, other ways are showing just a reveal, like they just sort of pull a paper down a little bit at a time and reveal the problem as they go. And then I've got on the left side of this slide, you can see someone used a child's chalkboard, which I thought was particularly creative uh, to present a problem. And that one looks like it's Calc 3. Uh, in the middle here, you've got one that is uh, differential equations for sure. And actually I have the ability to play this for <laughs> an earlier talk I, I gave, uh, but um, really neat to see how the students creatively, creatively come up with ways to present these problems. And even the poorer students, those who aren't even necessarily passing the class, often put together videos that are quite good. And I've even had a couple of the, the students who maybe didn't even quite pass the class, or maybe get a D, who I've asked if I could use the video in a future class with students. So it gives me an opportunity to encourage them in something and for them to, in a way, excel at something. And it also really helps me get a chance to know them a little bit better, which in the online setting is difficult. And so these video presentations give me a sense of each of the students. Um, you know, you hear their voices at least, you might even see them. Some of them use whiteboards, some of them use the chalkboards, you know, things like that. Um, and then they see a little bit of each other. So they're a little more connected. And to be honest, that's something I wanted to bring up. Um, one of the pieces of research that I read as I began going into this online teaching is that in an online class, students are more successful if they feel connected to their classmates and to their teacher. And to some degree, the more connected they feel um, to their classmates and their teacher, the more likely they are to succeed. And so that's one of the reasons that I've incorporated these discussions and, and valued them so highly. And one of the reasons that these video discussions I think are so successful and that students even like them so much is because it does give that added connection. And not only that, I guess I've got some reason that they give here eventually. Um, oh, this is just a second, I'll get to that. But here is just a topic sign up. I have the students uh, t give a, a topic and a problem. So I try to reduce the duplication of problems. I'm trying to come up with a new way to do this because I'd like to get more variety than I sometimes get. Um, I still end up getting the same kind of problems a lot. So I want to maybe- suggesting the problems or are you giving them a list to check from? There are a lot of questions about how do they decide what topic they're going to be doing videos on. Yeah, this is again something I'd like to improve my approach on. So if anyone has some great suggestions, uh, I'd love to hear them. But what I've had them do is just pick a topic from the unit. It's a review of the whole unit. And, you know, usually a student will pick, well, my goal is for them to pick something they found somewhat challenging and need to review. But you know that many students will also pick something that's really easy and they know they can present quickly. So you get a little bit of both. Um, but I certainly get some students who pick a challenge problem and it may even take 20 minutes and they really go through it and take a lot of time to work it out clearly. So I've been real impressed even with this sort of loose um, approach to letting them pick their own topic. It's been pretty successful. I don't let them pick a problem from a graded written assignment. Um, okay. I generally give them, I often give them keys for those anyways, so I figured it's not as helpful. And I really don't want those videos out there as much. I'd rather have them do them on their web work problems, which I'm fine with, 
or on uh, problems from the textbooks, which I really encourage, or problems they make up themselves, which I've had several, even this summer, who did that. Great. And there are a couple of questions about how your students are writing in either the, well, you've sort of explained how they do it in the videos, but how about in the discussions? How are they writing the mathematics? Well, they're, I mean, the majority of them now actually write them out on paper and they don't necessarily write them ahead of time. I do have a few, like the one that you can see in this video here, it was written out ahead of time and the student talked through it. And I had one I had on an earlier page. Uh, let's see, on my next page, this person wrote it out on the board, a whiteboard and did a really good, really good job with this variation of parameters. The student also did one on the parachute problem, which I thought was great, and end up posting in my course for future students to use. Um, let's see. Uh, here on the right, you can see a student who wrote it out on paper. This is by far the most common way students do it. So they write it out on paper and have a, a video mounted somehow above a phone or a tablet. Yeah. yeah okay. They've been very creative. If they're typing in a discussion, you know, a discussion board, do they, do you recommend ways for them to type mathematics or just take a picture? I've had multiple ways. I mean, Blackboard does have a, a, a math editor, not to say that's always very easy, but it's pretty much like the other math editors. It lets them fill in stuff. So they use that a lot. And then sometimes a student will write up the math and import the picture. They're getting to be more likely to do that now than they used to be which I think is great. A few of them even put together little videos and, and, and add a little attachment to a video when they're answering each other's questions. So multiple And do ways. you curate these videos? So do you worry about misinformation out there? There's a couple of questions about that. Since they're review for the exam, do you? Well, what I do my best to do, and I'll have to say it's not always possible, but if I can, I try to grade as many of them as I can in the time period between when they're due and when the test occurs, which uh, usually there's a couple days over which that test occurs. And so I'm going through and I add comments to those videos, um, well, to those discussion posts that the videos were in. If I see things that are missing, you know, I'll say something like, you know, great, great presentation of this problem. Um, you know, there were a couple of things I wanna make co comment on. You know, you need to be sure that you show this particular step. Um, I'll expect this on the test. So be careful about that. So, and, and sometimes the students will actually say that to each other. That's part of what they're being instructed to do is to mm -hmm. comment on each other's videos and see where things are missing. They don't do that as well as I'd like to see them do yet, <laughs> but uh, some will. That's great. But yeah, okay. I have to say that is something you have to be willing to work, work with and allow out there is that it, that's, that's gonna happen. I mean, there are a lot of uh, people who use uh, you know, students teaching on the board or presenting problems on the board, and it's gonna be very similar. I yeah. guess depends on how much you want to jump in and correct them as they go. But. And there's a lot of great ideas in the chat for using peer grading systems and make it part of their, their grade. Um, there's so a lot of sympathy for you out there because some of these videos are 20 minutes long. How do you manage to get to see all of them or read all of them? Well, I've gotten more efficient. I began to put it on two times the speed. And um, I will sometimes also <laughs> skip forward a little bit, you know, when I see they're just you know, read off uh, the equations and so forth. I'll skip to where they're done reading it off. And so I've gotten more efficient at grading them. Um, one of my students actually recommended to their fellow students that they increase my speed, you know, and they listen to my videos. And I was like, why have I never thought of doing that for my students' videos when I watch these and grade them? So that really was a very helpful thing to realize. I don't know why I hadn't thought of that before. You must not have teenage children. I do actually. <laughs> I learned just, that from my kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I just didn't, didn't talk about that topic with him. So um, I give bonus points for presenting particularly good, you know, good, clear presentations and you know, even for just writing things out really carefully. And so a lot of these are really a little bit of a boost to their grade. I actually give them um, 20 points, so sort of a double counted uh, discussion. Uh, points for the problem and then 30 points for the written homework. Uh, so they often even get some bonus points added into those. So it, it really is sort of a nice assignment. Uh, the students are pretty positive about it and they have uh, really done a good job with them. Let me go to um, so benefits of these student review videos. They master at least the topics they present and this is some of the things they say. It increases their confidence in that material since they've taught the problem to others. Um, 
It's more interesting to listen to fellow students. They often say this, although it is possible they make mistakes. Students sometimes say that too. Uh, they get to know each other better and I get to know them better. So those are things that I wanted to mention. And sometimes I can make them available for the future with their permission, of course. Um, for me, this disadvantage is that it does take a lot more time to grade than regular homework. And especially when they make their videos 10 to 30 minutes long. So, and I do, like I said earlier, try to post corrections or clarifications to each video when I have a chance. If I've gotten upgraded before the final, at least, um, I'm able to you know, give that feedback and help students use them as review. Um, student comments on the videos, I'll just maybe go through a couple of things they said. Um, really cool. Class was the first time I'd ever had to do something like that in a math class, and I found it really helpful. Uh, you get to really learn how to do a problem from the unit, uh, and also being able to see how other students in the class go about solving the problems. Another student said, I really enjoy making the example videos. Uh, it, I think it really promotes understanding of a topic and so forth. You get to interact with the classmates. Again, uh, really neat that the students recognize these things are, are happening. So there's a couple of questions. One is, have you had any issue with students who say that they're not able to record a video? They simply don't have the technology to do that? Not that. I've had foreign students who've had trouble uh, verbally mm -hmm. putting the video the together. And what I still want to see them do is even if they have to go slowly, you know, to, if they're taking the class in English, you know, I want them to just try. And I'm not going to penalize them if they're, you know, not good at English, but I want them to try. And so I think it would be basically a matter of um, figuring out ways of dealing with other situations that could, out, could come up. If someone's not able to speak, you know, how would I deal with that? And that's, that's, that's going to have to be just a different way of giving the assignment. So mm -hmm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But for most of the students, this has been a very useful uh, tool. And do you, do you ever assign it as group work, group work rather than individual work? That's a good idea, but I have not yet done that, have group uh, presentations. I've thought about doing that in my uh, online Honors Calc 1 this fall. So oh, yeah. that's one of the things I was thinking about. It might about build doing. community in some way that they get to interact with each other. Yeah, and it's gotten easier to do a group presentation than it used to be. So this one, the student was, uh, I don't know, uh, not negative in the first statement. I thought it was gonna be really bad, um, but you know, he says the video, video class discussions, he did not like them, right? <laughs> because he's not comfortable doing stuff like that. But then he says, I actually think there should have been more of them because I know I would have gotten better at making the videos. In fact, I think every stu student should do a video every week. <laughs> I'm thinking, whoa, that's quite a turnaround from what he started at. So even though I don't really care for his uh, way of expressing himself at the beginning, I thought it was really an interesting statement that he thought these were very useful uh, assignments. I could not handle grading one every week, but anyways, that would be more than I could handle. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, I think I'm gonna jump and show my courses themselves and get out of this presentation. Let's see here, which one I'm on. All right, so this is my differential equations course from a student view. And I meant to come in here sooner. I see we're coming down to the last six minutes now. But uh, essentially on the left side of the course, I have the welcome start here, which um, it will just show um, a little intro video to the course and some information about what they should expect. It gives my contact information on the right uh, and so on. So in the summer, uh, they should expect 30 to four hours per week in this intense seven week course. So they did not like to hear that. They didn't really believe that, but it does take a lot of time. There's course information that goes through and lists the uh, policies and, and different grading schemes and so forth. It's important in the course. I added a note about proctored exams for the summer because it was so we couldn't do in-person proctoring. And I ended up using Zoom proctoring uh, for the final exam and for the retake exams at the end of the, of the semester and end of the session. And that ended up working for me way better than the take home exams did. Um, so your prior experience had been that they would come in to do a face-to-face -face final examination. Yeah, all of the, the unit exams and the final exam would be proctored, not necessarily by, by me, but either in our, in our testing center or in a library or within a 
you know, at a testing center or with an approved proctor wherever the student is located. And so that's generally what I do with these online classes. An important thing to bring up here. So a very important component of the course actually, uh, because I don't feel comfortable giving a grade if I don't have some proctory component in the course. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have any trouble with the Zoom proctoring, I think. Well, I couldn't say I don't, didn't have any problems, but I would say that I felt 100% better about it than I did about giving a take home final exam, which I ended up doing in the spring and just saw so much cheating that I was quite upset. <laughs> so um, it made me want to desperate to try something. And I felt that the Zoom proctoring that I did in the summer here, although it took me a lot of time, really uh, paid off and that students weren't collaborating. Uh, they weren't able, they didn't have time to enter things into their phone or into the computer to find answers and you know look up things on Chegg and other things. Um, so I really felt better about it. It wasn't impossible for them to cheat still, but I don't so think there's a lot cheating. of um, detailed questions about that. Uh, like, <laughs> what does Zoom proctoring mean for you? I mean, this could be a whole nother talk, but maybe it just could be words. Yeah, honestly, it was my first experiment with it, and I, I started with retake tests in the beginning of the week, so the beginning of last week actually, and then gave the final exams on Wednesday, and basically, I had the students use their camera to do like a, a 360 of their work area so I could see that they were on a hopefully an open table with not much on it. That was one of the instructions I'd given ahead of time. Um, they phone, I, you know, I asked where they had put it and you know, they had it off either in another room or off to the side. Of course, they might have another phone, but you know, um, doing my best to help them see what the expectations are. I checked their calculator, their blank paper, their ID. Um, and, and for the final, they had a or plastic transform table they could use. So I saw the sheet both sides, you know, but they have a computer in front of them that, you know, they're supposedly not touching the keyboard, um, but they're able to see the, um, the test that I had on the, the screen. So for the retakes, I used a PDF for that. For the final, I used uh, web work to, pr to show those problems two at a time uh, in a test format. So there's a lot of details that I can't really describe quickly, but it seemed to really reduce the cheating. And I was very happy with that. Great, thank you. So let's see, we have just a few minutes here. Um, I've shown a lot of these things in the, the PowerPoint, um, but the What's Do Win page um, gives a schedule that shows a calendar for the uh, each, in this case, it's the summer session, so each day, normally it'd be for each week. It shows what they do and for each of the, I, I break it up, I think in Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday assignment deadlines, usually with a normal semester. And so I have several different assignments due each week. In this case, things due each day under different categories. So graded written work, um, web work, and discussions on the right. And then I give the video topics that they should be watching and the video lecture numbers uh, here for each day or each week if you're looking at a regular semester. And so that just goes through and shows what's expected and helps them stay on, on task with things. So that's important. Um, there's an ask a question forum that students are encouraged to use to ask questions. And actually some student names show up here, so maybe I won't stay there too long. Um, but uh, it is a place that students can um, pose questions that I will then answer for everybody. And that's helpful whenever possible. Um, sometimes I will actually post uh, to the ask a question forum with um, a commonly asked question from a previous semester or to take an email that student ask and post it myself in the ask a question forum so I can give an answer to everybody. So that's really been a really helpful component as well. Um, the preview week activities are something I give in the, the week we have before our classes start. Uh, although students can certainly complete them in the first day or two of the class. I make them do usually the second day of the class. And they basically require the student to create a single PDF of a written assignment and a printed PDF from uh, one of the visualization tools. And so really getting them to, to be able to do the things they're gonna need to do to turn in the work for the class. That's been something that's come up in a lot of the webinars that you have to do some direct instruction on the mechanics of how you're teaching the class, what your expectations are. Yeah, and I think that's really, really helpful. For differential equations, that online class, I have a um, course information quiz that I know many people have used something like that, um, but I included uh, the questions in there that really 
Um, we're meant to direct them toward the right approach to the whole class. So my favorite question I put in there is, I will, or true or false, I, will com I should complete assignments on the day that they are due. <laughs> and the answer, correct answer, of course, is false. And of course, many of the students first will say true, but um, you know, then I give an explanation uh, and they get a chance to retake the quiz three times total. But um, you know, the basic explanation is, of course, you, you need to be really completing the assignments a couple days ahead of time so that you know if you have questions and you can ask and have time for me to get back to you with the answers. Also, you don't wanna be super stressed in the course. And if you, you know, wanna reduce that stress, getting your stuff done a few days ahead of time is gonna be really, really important. So I, I try to really emphasize that. And since I've done that, I've seen really dramatic improvements in student um, levels of frustration being lower and a lot more people being ahead. And so I've really been pleased with that, the results of that course information quiz. And again, I'd be glad to share the other questions I have in that um, if people are interested, but that's probably the most important one. So what other questions do you have? Because I think we're, we're running out of time here. Yeah, um, so let me just uh, remind everybody that the recording of this webinar will be on the AMS uh, education webpage, and I'll put that in the chat in a second again. Um, and that this has been recorded and your participation, we're going to move to questions so I can open up the mic to people who want to ask questions. Um, but if you're participating, then you're part of the recording. And again, if you're going to head out into the world, please, uh, when you close the Zoom meeting, there's going to be a survey, which we hope you will take a moment to fill out. I'll just start with the, some of the questions that we didn't quite get to. So one question was about synchronized lectures. Do you do you do anything synchronous or is your whole class asynchronous? These online classes are completely asynchronous. The only thing that I did that was synchronous this summer was to run the final exam Zoom proctoring sessions. So, okay. you know, I had to have those be synchronous or I couldn't be there. <laughs> so. Yeah. And then the other question is, how do you get them started on conversations? So in these discussions or the video discussions, how do you make those rich and not sort of formulaic? Well, I can't say that I have a wonderful uh, answer for that because really it depends on the students. I give them the prompts, I require them to address certain things, and then depending on the the depth of the students, we get different results. And I've had you know, a lot of really wonderful students who have enriched that whole process because they've been in the class. And I'll, I'll just have to say that that can make all the difference. You know, you've got a couple of students, even one student who really gets into talking about math and answering questions completely and you know, setting the bar higher, it has really made a big difference in those discussions. You'll still have some students who they look for the minimum that they could possibly do in state in order to sort of maybe satisfy the uh, requirements of the assignment. And of course, many that don't even maybe look at the requirements very carefully and therefore don't satisfy the requirements. But um, I've still seen, particularly in these summer sessions, um, really rich uh, discussions going on in the ask a question and in the um, concepts applications. So like, where do they see differential equations in in, in the real world and you know what applications could they find so really interesting and you know positive things I want to encourage you know those kind of discussions students talking about how wonderful it is that they see this and how they really like that seeing this relationship and how this really made sense when they saw this and wow I'm you know I never I wish I'd known this before I took this other class and, and things like that that's great uh, there's some logistical questions like when you recorded your lectures, did you have issues getting all the boards, I guess, into the camera frame or did you focus everything on one board, on a single board so the camera could just record? Well, the way I did it was using a smart board and it's a very small space, I know, and that's the restriction I was willing to live with uh, because then what I have is something that fits on the computer screen nicely and my voice is recorded. They don't get my face for that kind of video, um, but they get to hear what I'm saying as I write anything that I write on the board. And you know, even get some student question and answer. And whenever I'm able, I'm uh, if I keep it in the, the lecture video, I try to you know make the, that louder there, or you know put that into the closed captioning so that it's easier to 
um, tell what was being said. Great. A couple of questions about the relationship between sort of the web work homework, the written homework, and your quiz and test questions, sort of how, how do those fit together as a constellation? Are the quizzes very much similar to the homework or? Yeah, I mean, quizzes originally had been designed to be given in class, right, in a face-to-face -face setting. So I sort of just adapted what I had, um, how I'd broken things up. I usually don't give the same question type on a quiz as I do on a home, written homework. So they would be complementary to each other. Um, so that students are, are getting some written feedback on uh, things in different contexts. So the quiz structure, I usually generally make them rather short. Um, once in a while, they're both sides of a page, um, but, but often they're just one side of a page. And the homeworks are, tend to be longer, particularly in differential equations, where it's sort of like a practice test, uh, giving them a chance to, to show me that they know a lot of the material for, for that, that unit. Um, and, it's a little different in Calc 3 where I give more smaller homework um, assignments, but even there, some of those are a little bit larger, longer than the quizzes. Um, web work problems often complement what I've got in the written work. Um, there will be some problems that are the same type, mm -hmm. um, but they don't have as much uh, scaffolding perhaps in those ones. Um, but there are a lot of concept questions I can ask in web work and visual oriented questions that um, really quickly help students to ga gain insight into what's going on if they're able to complete them or as they complete them. So that's my, my goal there is to complement again what I've done in my written and you know written work essentially and I don't like them really necessarily to be exactly the same as the book problems either but uh, honestly I have to say students don't do those book problems as much because they're not graded. Right, right. Uh, have, what kinds of student privacy issues have you encountered in requiring students to uh, make demonstration videos or Zoom proctoring? How do you address them? Um, I don't know that I've heard many concerns along those lines. The students can, of course, post their video in a uh, unlisted way on YouTube so that the link takes other classmates there, but you know it's not found on a search. And I do have some students who've chosen to do that. Um, I think, I don't know what happens when they're placed on Dropbox or Google um, Docs, but I'm guessing that, again, it's sort of like being unlisted. You have to give the, the link away. So again, that's, I guess, my best answer to that question. Right. Do you use GeoGebra at all? I have, and I, I do. Um, I think I use Desmos more, um, partly because it did certain things more uh, intuitively, I felt, um, for example, orthogonal trajectories, I thought the way that you enter them in Desmos was more natural than mm -hmm. in GeoGebra. But um, I think I've created some things in GeoGebra for um, bifurcations. And so those bifurcations, I think, are from GeoGebra that I placed links to in my course. So some examples where the students can move things around and see how the bifurcation changes and so forth. And there's, so there's some links to that on my um, uh, are your web website. I'm sorry, I didn't oh, hear. Oh, great. So maybe we should put your website link in. No, maybe you should put your, we should get your website link into the chat. I think that would be very helpful yeah. to, to all of our attendees. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll ask you to multitask. And mm -hmm. are your web work problems available in the problem, problem library? Um, not yet. <laughs> okay. I really would like to uh, get them on there, um, but they're not there yet. Some of the problems I displayed would be there already because they may not have been changed much, if at all, um, but others are probably not. So that link I just put in there uh, will give you links to CalcPlot 3D and the Direction Field app and also to some GeoGebra apps that I mentioned a second or a minute ago about uh, bifurcations. So. Um, here, I just copied it in because it was not the the default is just amongst the panelists. So I put it in oh, for everybody you. so the attendees can see it. So even though awesome. it's coming from me, it's really from Paul. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I didn't notice that. <laughs> now it's very confusing. Uh, so there's another question. Are the quizzes timed now that they're remote? Do students complete them online or write, scan, or upload? Are they given at say one o'clock or do the students check them out for say 20 minute chunks and return them? 
I think any of those ways could be done, but what I've chosen to use them as is another written assignment. It's just in a different category. So um, they just scan their work and submit it. Um, I used to make a bigger deal about them working together on take home quizzes. Uh, now I just make sure that I have an honor statement on the take home tests, that mm -hmm. they are not going to work together and um, make a big deal there, you know, but mm -hmm. not on the quizzes so much. Uh, one other Quick note I wanted to make about the online books. Um, in my Count Three book in particular, um, I was finding some, a few typos here and there, and I encouraged the students to look for them and to help me fix those. And I, I basically said I'd give them bonus points anytime they found an error in the, the textbook. And it was amazing the amount of, <laughs> number of students who began to do the problems in the book and who began to read the book carefully and give me some of that feedback, especially just before the tests. So it was sort of nice. It was weird that having a few typos in the book was actually a benefit, but it really ended up encouraging students to read the book carefully and to actually take time to look at it. I so, hope you left them in. No, I've been fixing them regularly, <laughs> but there are probably more there that can be found. There's always more. There's one question from the very beginning. What techniques does the teacher, does the speaker use to get students to turn up on time? Is this even an important matter? Well, since it's all asynchronous, um, oh, the right. on time part isn't really quite relevant, although completing the assignments by the deadline is important. So <laughs> that would be the way I'd interpret it. Yeah. I, I give that course information quiz that helps them think about the fact they should be doing assignments a few days ahead of time. That's really important. I keep reminding students of that as they get down to the deadline and, and haven't been completing it. I can tell, especially on web work, that, you know, oh boy, everyone's on right now and it's 10 o'clock at night and it's due at midnight. So mm. maybe you guys should have uh, been working on this yesterday. And, you know, I do push back assignments. Sometimes I'll make it worth 75% for the next day so they can mm. still get some of the credit for it, especially mm -hmm. if I see a large number of students who, you know, delayed, yeah. procrastinated. There's lots of uh, thanks in the chat. Uh, you're a great resource, uh, asset, and developer. <laughs> and I could I agree with that. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, looks, like, um, looks like we may have hit all the questions. If there's somebody whose question I missed, uh, I apologize. And we still have a little bit of time if you want to plot that back into the text, into the chat, so that I can get it. Oh, somebody put some wonderful resource in there. Oh no, I thought it was a video, yikes. <laughs> so I'll just give it another few minutes to see if uh, there's any questions. I did my best. I actually got kicked off the Zoom call for a minute or two. So if I missed tell. you, you <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I was afraid that it was you that had frozen, but then it turned out it was me. Uh, here's one. So how are, the, how are problems chosen for students to do in the videos? And how often do they do them? Well, the problems that I have, that they complete themselves in their videos, as I mentioned earlier, I left open to them to choose from the, uh, the unit material. And I did tell them that they should choose them either from the textbook problems or their web work problems or make up their own problems uh, that did, of course, reflect what we've been doing. And I've had students do all three. The most common is to choose a web work problem. Uh, so, you know, what I wanted to avoid was them selecting problems from the graded written work. Right. There's a couple of questions about uh, whether you've used oral exams at all. I know that that's one of the things that's come up recently is uh, to combat the cheating. Yeah, I really thought about it this year, especially in the spring and the summer here, but it didn't seem practical when I had 47 or even 37 students. Uh, I think if you had, you know, under 10 for a class, which I don't know how often that happens, but I know it can, uh, that would be much more feasible. Uh, I have a hard time avoiding them getting some written component in any way, though, unless mm -hmm. I suppose they're talking me through the problem, that would be helpful. But if you're doing an oral and you, you know, just if you're worried about them having references there for your um, your written exams, you know, they could just as easily have those references there for the oral exams, I guess, um, yeah. if you're not able to see, you know, all of what they have there. But. Uh, in terms of the technology you use, you're using Zoom and Blackboard, am I right? Well, I'd started using Zoom recently, you know, this spring and, and summer, 
with the online classes. I use Zoom also to meet with students that mm -hmm. want to go over a, a graded assignment. It's really easy for me to go through that on OneNote, um, either using my iPad or the, the, the notebook computer. Um, but uh, mostly, you know, I've used Camtasia to create my videos. And then, you know, more recently, of course, we're using Zoom in the remote classes. Mm -hmm. So, Do you see any difference between the classes that are entirely asynchronous versus the remote classes? In turn, or do you see that some hybrid would be the best model? Or do you feel that really one or the other? And that's a good question. That was something I really struggled on uh, in making choices for this fall. I chose to make my uh, intermediate algebra classes remote, which meant I meet with them for their normal class times on Zoom. Um, so three or four times, I guess it would be four times a week. And even though that's a little bit more um, time commitment for me regularly, uh, it really, I think, helps pace the class for those students and keep them where they need to be. So that's the real benefit of the remote approach. I think a hybrid approach could be useful in that way too, keeping them you know, at, at on pace. But um, I think the real advantage of the online is that then people can take it and not have to worry about it interfering with other with work or other commitments. You know, that's one of the issues in this COVID period here where we have to consider, you know, that people have definitely different uh, conditions than they would have during their normal face-to-face -face semesters. Um, they may not have the childcare options. They may have different, different issues that, you know, that are going to play into that. Sure. And even time zone issues I've heard for, you know, if you're at a yeah. research one university, you could have students from all over the place. That's one of the things that being a regional university is an advantage. I haven't had any students in different time zones yet. But. I have definitely had that even at the college where I'm at, the community college. So teaching online particularly. Yes. Oh, right. Yes, of course. Yeah. But when we went suddenly remote, that was not a, not one of the issues. Right. Uh, looks like we have another question. So in our university, we can only apply exams which last 72 hours. Do you have any suggestions to grade the students? I'm not exactly sure what that means. Yeah. He says, can you say some more about that? Uh, yeah, here, no, no, looks the same. Oh well, yeah, no, I'm not quite sure what that what that means. But if you'd like to ask your question, I can hand you the mic. Let me see if I can find you. I see while you're looking for that, uh, yeah. someone else asked a question about where the students posted their links to their videos. Um, YouTube, Dropbox, uh, Google. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what is it? Google Docs. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think the other one is the Microsoft, you know, location. But all, those are the basic. The cloud sharing options and YouTube are the most common. Okay. I don't I, want them putting them right into the course because that tends to overpower the uh, uh, system, particularly when I try to reuse the course for the next semester. <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, Giselle's question is, and I hope I'm not saying her name wrong, uh, about the window of time. So her university has a requirement that the, the tests have to be open for at least three days. Mm -hmm. um, and I, she, I guess that's not really the same thing as uh, proctoring. Uh, but it, you could have it open for three days. It's just they have to choose a, a period of time within those three days. I guess when I've given proctored exams, I've given a three-day time window during which they could take it. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the uh, Zoom proctoring, I'm not as comfortable with the larger time period, uh, mm. per particularly because of the uh, fact that the students still have their written work. So, you know, whether or not you, I guess you can make uh, as many final exams as you want to have sessions, but uh, it, it definitely multiplies your time. Uh, yeah. task if you're going to be, be you care, sit careful there about for it. 72 hours <laughs> waiting for somebody to come in. And Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I think that we've got 
Uh, oh, there's a question whether you would be willing to make your course syllabus available in some way. Um, if the person wants to email me, I could send it to them. That's She's actually my easy. colleague from CSUN. Okay. So if you send it to me, then I'll get it to her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the course syllabus as in the, the schedule of, of things being taught or the syllabus in the more complete sense? I think the more complete sense is my guess yeah. because the curiosity is probably about the interaction of all these assignments and how they're managed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see how much detail I have in there, but it certainly many of them come up in there. Yeah. No, I mean, just uh, if you just copy and paste it into, into an email, I'm sure that would be more yeah. than enough. I could attach a PDF. Yeah. And now, and now everybody wants your syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. And uh, remember the link, uh, the link at the AMS webpage. Let me put that one more time. We'll have the link to these talks. <laughs> And we'll see what we can do about getting the chat in. I'm going to ask Paul to save the chat because I've lost some of the chat when I uh, got kicked off the call. All right. And if you don't mind, I think it's automatically saving, but maybe not. So we better do it. And I just want to thank all of our attendees, um, especially the 86 that are still with us. Um, <laughs> you, were, uh, you were a vibrant lot. It was uh, practically athletic to keep up with the chat. Uh, and that's exactly where we want to be. We want to be making sure that we're serving the community. So I think that with that, I'm going to let you all get back to your days. And thank you, Paul, once again, for a wonderfully informative presentation. Really appreciate it. Very okay. glad to be here. I'm going to clap share. for everybody. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Take good care. Let me stop recording.